Hey, I'm Mike Bruce, the founder and CEO of Visible. As you scale your company, having the right guides at your side can make all of the difference. Each episode, we'll talk to fellow founders, investors, and experts. We'll dive into their zone of genius, as well as hear about their past mistakes to give you a better chance of success. This podcast is for founders by founders. This is the Founders Forward. All right, everyone. I am super excited for today's guest. Uh, probably long overdue. Uh, I want to introduce everyone to Christian Anderson. Uh, he's actually one of the original founders of Visible who actually pulled me into the business to help start it with him. Uh, Christian's currently a co-founder and partner at High Alpha, uh, an incredible venture studio that conceives, launches, and scales technology companies. Uh, prior to High Alpha, uh, Christian was the founder of Studio Science, which we're certainly going to get dig into, uh, a leading design and innovation consultancy. Uh, he sold that, but Christian's also an active angel investor, uh, previously co-founded Gravity Ventures, a C-stage venture fund, and we were just doing a quick count. I think over 100 different investments uh, Christian has made across the spectrum of companies just getting started to companies right before they go public. Uh, Christian, thanks for joining us today on the, uh, the Founders Forward. It's great to be here, Mike. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I want to dig into, you know, let's start studio science. Before studio science, it was called K plus A, uh, uh, the design, this kind of prolific design agency you started. But it was kind of the impetus for some of the work you started to do with startups and, and Gravity Ventures and, and, and now High Alpha. What, what was it originally that drew you to working with startups and, and early stage companies? Yeah, you know, when I when I graduated from college, uh, I got a I graduated from Anderson University with a degree like a generic degree in design. And um, my my first job out of school was with a, a company called Intermark Interactive Technologies. And this was kind of the late 90s, the dawn of the first wave of the internet boom. And uh, it's a really funny company. They were building internet enabled touchscreen kiosks. Uh, that uh, is kind of like almost like Amazon before Amazon, right? So okay. these were installed in gas stations and restaurant lobbies and hotels. And you could walk up and you could just order stuff from it, like random stuff, like things from the Sharper Image. You could order a bouquet of flowers from 1-800-Flowers, um, print coupons. It was kind of a, it was a neat idea that ultimately didn't work. Uh, it failed to gain traction. And so my, really my first and only real job um, I only had for about six months before I was uh, ceremoniously relieved of duties as they wound the company down. And my, my former boss uh, encouraged me to hang out my own shingle as really like a freelance designer. Yeah. And, um, and I said, you know what, I, I think I'll do that. And, and that's what I did. I opened up shop in, in Indianapolis above at the time, what was a sunglasses hut. Uh, and, and later uh, uh, Starbucks, so I got to smell coffee all day. And, um, you know, when I started out, it was one man band and I just did anything, right? So you need uh, brochures, you need a brochure website. I mean, we're talking 97, 98 here, so really early innings. Um, and, and over time, I, you know, my dad gave me some advice, which was, you know, early on, if you're starting a, a career in professional services, just say yes, right? So really, <laughs> you know, what somebody asked me to do, I was like, of course we do that. And, and that dragged me into all sorts of weird things. So if you're going to design a, you know, brochureware website circa 1988, it was logical for the customer to also say, can you host my email server, which was, again, like hosted on a micron pc under my desk for 100 customers i was basically running their pop email and smtp email servers um hey can you do you do any printing sure so i bought a digital press you know um you know do you do apparel of course and and so really just i did everything and um over time began to kind of manage a network of contractors and and then um uh, around you know 2000 into 2000 the whole dot-com thing kind of popped and i remember having another conversation with my dad which was hey you know you should you should either go work for somebody or have somebody work for you but you know build something kind of that transcends you right as a, yeah. as a kind of infinite freelancer and that's what i did and around the same time we started getting more and more kind of 
you know, generation two internet companies as customers. Um, and it just so happened that in Indianapolis at the time, that was becoming like a regional hotbed for what we now call SaaS. Back then we called it ASPs, application service providers. And uh, we began increasingly working with those types of companies. And that included, of course, Exact Target uh, before the acquisition by Salesforce, Angie's List, um, Aprimo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we were just fortunate in the city at the time, you had a lot of these at the time, and they were small, but venture backed technology companies that ended up yeah. becoming very big billion dollar concerns. And we were fortunate enough to be able to work with them kind of all the way uh, through their life cycle. So we ended up carving out a little niche working in technology. Uh, I stopped saying yes to everything and said no to most things. And if customers weren't venture backed technology companies that were in need of very specific either brand or product design services, we, we said no. I got out of the t-shirt business for lack of a better word. So that was kind of my entry into the space, um, you know, for, for lack of a better word. From the, I find uh, this is not on the outline, but uh, you going to, to your dad for, for kind of talking shop and, and business. What was that relationship like as you went from, you know, starting your own, hanging your own shingle to like you partner at, at High Alpha now. Do you still talk to your dad and, and catch up yeah, with him? Yeah, yeah. My, my daddy's 81 years old, and I would still put him in the camp as my, you know, tier one mentor and, and business advisor. You know, I, I was pretty entrepreneurial from an early age. So I, mm -hmm. again, I never, never had, I only had a W-2 once in my life, and it was for six months, but I was always making money. And, you know, even as a very, very little kid was pretty industrious and, and looking for ways to kind of hustle. And it's funny when I interview entrepreneurs or potential co-founders, one of the questions I always ask them is, tell me the story about the first time you remember making money for yourself. And it's shocking how consistent those stories are over time. I mean, you can replace what it was they were making or selling, but oftentimes it starts with, well, I got sent home in third grade because I was buying lemon heads at the 7-Eleven across the street from the playground and marking them up 100% and selling them to my friends. And, and then I started the lawn mowing business. But by the end of the summer, I wasn't mowing lawns. I, I had a team and I was just hanging flyers and printing T-shirts in high school and, and so on and so forth. So I was always pretty entrepreneurial. And I think I got that from my dad. My dad ran, my dad was an interior designer and an architectural designer, and he built a really, you know, a pretty big and important firm in that space in the 60s and 70s and 80s. He actually still does it. He's 81 and he still works. Wow. So I, I had that modeled for me. Like, I, you know, if my dad had been an insurance agent, you know, who was home at 5 p.m. every day and able to make every soccer practice and and, uh, I, you know, I think it probably would have shaped me differently, but I grew up in an environment where my dad owned a thriving small business in the, in the services sector. And so uh, he modeled tacitly a lot of that for me as a young person. And then as I got older and struck out on my own, I didn't know what else to call. So I, I yeah. called him. And uh, it's interesting. I would say that like 90% of his advice was very good um, and maybe 10% of it you know, in hindsight, I would have maybe done some things differently, but I think a, like a nine out of 10 hit rate for advice is pretty tremendous. Really is. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. I love the, uh, the, the stories when you hear of, of founders, what they, what they originally tried to do or, or companies that they started to try to create eighth grade. I tried, uh, we did a, an ice cream shop, uh, at school but then it also had a 50 50 raffle, which is just an incredibly high margin business. Um, but then we got, we got a, we got a, we got a cease and desist from the school saying, I, I, lived, I, the lived, ramble, but. I grew up in a very rural context. I was born in New York, but we moved to Arkansas when I was five. So my dad was like the quintessential New Yorker. My mother was, a, as my little sister calls her, a very refined hillbilly. And so we moved <laughs> to a very rural context. And I remember when I was like 11, I had a lemonade stand set up but my nearest neighbor was like a mile away and the nearest neighbor from them was a mile away. So we got very little traffic at the lemonade stand. And I remember taking that igloo cooler and bungee coordinate to the back of my four wheeler and I would drive door to door. And by the way, so if there's any like aspiring lemonade stand entrepreneurs, this is the playbook you should run. So instead of 
like depending on the kindness of strangers to like stop and drink your little warm, dirty, gross lemonade, put it on the back of a four wheeler and just go door to door. And I would just knock on doors and put the, you know, cup of lemonade in their face and say, that's 50 cents. And my, my hit rate went way up from depending on kind of passive uh, leads to, it's kind of the difference between inbound and outbound sales. So I was, I was just going to say, this is an SDR. Like outbound or lemonade. lemonade stand, you know, um, you know, early, early on, but, but yeah, so he, he you know, and there's been, as, as of course, there's always a story. There's been lots and lots of people who poured into me and um, lots of people who actively gave me counsel. And then a lot of other people that I just studied and watched and wanted to emulate. Um, but I, I never had like the formal mentor or any of that. Um, so I kind of, I kind of had to, to string that together on my own. Yeah, very cool. So you, you studio science, you know, you sell, um, you start high alpha back in, in 2015. And, you know, just for some context, and one of the things we're doing for season two is talking about investors and, and giving founders a better chance of success, you know, when they're just getting started and through the lens of, you know, raising capital. I think one of the interesting things is that uh, more and more prevalent now are these studios. I think High Alpha was one of the, the original, if not the original uh, yeah. studios where you were building companies. Um, so, you know, what was, what was the idea behind starting High Alpha, one of the, the original or uh, one of the original studios and how should founders think of High Alpha as a vehicle for, for starting their own company? Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe in terms of the catalyst for it, I'll back up again. Yeah. So I'm running Studio Science. That turns into a real business and goes from two staff people to four to eight to 16 to 30 and so on and so forth. And, you know, in the midst of that, I'm serving almost exclusively, you know, high growth software companies. And I'm, and I'm looking at those business models going, boy, that looks really that looks really great. I'm over here selling brains by the pound. So basically, you know, selling time and the way you scale a business like that is by selling more and hiring more, you know, carbon-based life forms to deliver on what you've sold. And I, I became very intrigued by these kind of product-focused businesses and spent a lot of time trying to figure out how could we turn a services business into something that looks more like a product business. And I think the gateway drug for me was I began to take equity positions and our customers in lieu of full comp. And that helped introduce me, to, albeit a very rudimentary level, but it began to introduce me to the dynamics of um, funding rounds and how mm -hmm. you would find a company, value a company, how you would structure the investment. And so I really got like a little backdoor, I, I wouldn't even call it an MBA, but like a little backdoor education on investing. And that then led to me uh, just making angel investments. So into, into just because of the orbit I was in, I was meeting lots of uh, you know, young companies and young entrepreneurs that were raising money. And, and I, uh, the business was successful enough at that juncture that uh, I would just make direct investments into those businesses off the balance sheet of the design firm. And, um, and as that began to become more formalized, my partner, Mike Fitzgerald, and I launched a seed stage venture fund a long time ago, you know, in 2010, when they were not nearly as prevalent. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there, there were none in, in our neck of the woods. Uh, and so we launched this, this fund called Gravity Ventures, and we started making, you know, $100,000 investments. And, and we ultimately raised six of those funds over about the same number of years and, you know, invested in over 40 companies. And I just learned a ton. I learned a ton, but I, it also, like, grew my network in a really radical fashion. And, and ultimately... Uh, I didn't coin this phrase, but I say it a lot, you know, your network is your net worth. And so it was a way for me to radically accelerate the growth of my network. And so after serving software companies, investing as an angel investor, and then doing that more formally through a structured vehicle, like my next step was I'd like to start, I'd like to, let's go start some companies. We've got yeah. this design firm with MBAs and engineers and designers and all of these kind of raw materials of innovation let's start building some companies. So uh, really all three of the, the folks that I'm partnered with now at High Alpha were involved in various capacities and, and partnering with me to launch software companies, uh, many of which you know. One of them was Visible. So, you know, Visible actually was kind of ideated in a conference room at Studio Science. 
Um, and it was born out of the pain that I felt managing all of these disparate investments out of Gravity Ventures and, and trying to get a better handle on how these companies were performing, improving communication with the entrepreneurs. And uh, I think our innovation that was so important, Mike, that you had a front row seat to was mm -hmm. it's one thing to go build a product out of a services firm, but usually they fail because a services firm's first love is revenue and consulting revenue. And so even if you build the most terrific solution to a problem, if you're if you've got a, a staff that's splitting their time between serving customers and trying to advance this product, the product's always going to lose. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we, we discovered early on was the key is you need to bring a co-founder in from outside the organization as soon as possible to, to own it, which is exactly what we did with, with you and Visible. So you were a co-founder that didn't work with me at Studio Science. You came in from the outside, and this was your, like, if you didn't advance the ball, you didn't eat, right? So it was it was critical to bring a, a, an outside partner in who could really own the business and not be conflicted by, oh, well, let's not spend time on this. Let's go work on, you know, a, a paying gig or what have you. Mm -hmm. So so we had been, so Mike, Eric, and Scott and I had all been involved in a number of those companies um, kind of on the side. And uh, when, when Eric and Mike and Scott, who were all at Salesforce by way of the exact target acquisition, um, in, you know, let's call it 2014, 2015, uh, were rolling out of Salesforce. We, it's a really cool story. We literally, the four of us said, let's go start something together. And we went to one of my partner's cabins in Southern Indiana, and we spent the weekend there designing our dream job. We were at a point where we could uh, dictate what we did next a little bit more on our own terms, as you might imagine. And so we yeah. We spent two days just mapping out what would our dream job look like. And the short version is there were some things that were very important to all four of us. We, we, loved, we loved software. We loved technology. Um, we loved startups in particular. And maybe more importantly, we loved the people who started startups. So we wanted to do something where we were working with founders. We wanted to do something where we could replicate the historic successes of the of the exact targets in a market like Indianapolis. So what we, we saw the transformational effect of what a multi-billion dollar exit does for a startup community. And our thought was, what if we could do a lot of those? And what if we could get smarter every time, aggregate our learnings and just move faster? You know, most, you know, most of the most successful SaaS entrepreneurs in the world have only done it two or three times, right? right. And that makes you a world-class expert. What if you do it 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times? And um, we, we all really valued design and knew that design was a huge competitive differentiator that we could control. And so our thought was, what if we married up the best of a design firm and a venture fund with the idea of starting high scale, high growth software companies in our, in our backyard? That uh, is pretty incredible. You mentioned kind of this idea of learning, right? If we get enough companies, you know, if you do, if you do two, you're world class. Uh, I believe the first kind of cohort of companies was 2014, 15. So now we got mm -hmm. six plus years of data. Uh, what, what have you learned from, you know, the first kind of set of companies that were started to now, you know, I think the juice uh, was the most recent launch that I saw maybe in the last week or so. What, any, yeah. Anything stick out that you're doing different from 2015 to, 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 to 2021? <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say there's, there's a handful of things. I mean, the, the first would be, I think out of the gate, we had a misguided belief that we could be world-class at every functional discipline required to launch and scale a, a software company. Uh -huh. And the reality is, is that it's, it's almost impossible to be world-class at one thing, much less 12 things, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about what are all those things that are required, right? You got to capitalize the business. You, you need HR expertise, recruiting expertise, marketing, go-to-market, design, finance, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I would say maybe by year three, we decided we need to put more wood behind fewer number of arrows. Now we still offer all of those kind of uh, services as a co-founder, no question about it. But when we thought about where do we want to really over-index, we, we really landed on 
you, got, you have to have great people. So recruiting needs to be a core function, whether it's recruiting in a high alpha or recruiting uh, co-founders or recruiting into the portfolio companies themselves. Finance and capital, if, if you can't sort that out, you're gonna be in really big trouble. So we really wanted to prioritize building out our venture team and our finance function so that our early companies could be instrumented like a company uh, that's much, much, much further along. And that is a mm -hmm. huge, that's huge leverage. And then finally, as I mentioned previously, design and design with a capital D that kind of transcends frosting and aesthetics, but the design of the organization, the design of the product, the design of the go to market motion, marketing, et cetera. And so those, I would say over time, one big learning was just whatever you're really, really good at is where you should focus and continue to invest. I'd say the other probably big learning is you can have a big market, you can have a well-identified problem, you can build a killer solution, but if you don't have the right co-founder or co-founding team at inception, it really doesn't matter, right? Because almost all of your assumptions are are going to be wrong out of the gate. So you're, you might have a beautifully designed product, but it may not serve customers the way they need to be served. You might have identified a fantastic market and then determined, wow, we we they don't want our product or there's a subset of this market that's more important or, or where we should start. If you have a great co-founding team around the table on day one, they'll figure all of that out. You can have great market, great product, yeah. not the right co-founding team, and you're in big trouble. So we've we've really redoubled our focus on trying to understand what makes a great founder in our model and, and spending more time and energy and calories finding them, vetting them, and supporting them. What what type of founder uh, do you think works well? And you know, I'm I'm a founder. I could go the, you know, I'm doing this myself. I own 100 percent, or me and my co-founders own 100 percent of the company out of the gate. Versus maybe going to a studio, uh, and I'm owning you know less than that because high up is going to take a chunk. What, right. what what founders work well in the studio model? Uh, and then what again? Yeah, what are you looking for? Are there any any, any interesting data points that you've seen now, yeah. like finding mm -hmm. the right type of founding team? Well, as, as much as we've tried to like identify one archetype, uh, that has eluded us. And I actually mm -hmm. don't think I don't think it exists. I would say in general, though, uh, there's probably two types of founders. And and you know the first would be the uh, the founder that's probably earlier in their career, that uh, in charge of a kind of terminal leadership role maybe in sales, maybe in product at a, at a really high growth company. So somebody who's seen the movie, they might be VP of sales, probably weren't one of the founding team members. And, and it's likely that that person is going to be a founder at some point in the future, right? Um, but maybe the, the exit hasn't happened that allows her to go home and, and tell her husband, hey, uh, I'm quitting my job and, and we're gonna go do this, right? So it's, it's somebody probably earlier in their career that, has a big chunk of responsibility in a, in a very successful company that wants to be a founder and the studio model allows them to pull that timeline up five years, right? Because they're going to be swarmed with support. They're not going to have to worry about how they, you know, they're not going to have to go without a salary for the first two years. They're not going to have to worry about how to navigate benefits. They're not going to have to worry about finding a technical co-founder uh, or things of that nature. So that's yeah. one archetype that we've had a ton of success with. The other counterintuitively is somebody who's maybe a second or third time founder. They've done this. They've done it exceedingly well. Um, they don't need to launch a company in a studio model because they're looking for dough or because they don't know how to do it, but rather because they've done it two or three times, they know the studio offers them a vehicle that alleviates a ton of the early brain damage that they have to deal with if they were going all the way back to zero. And if you look at the 30 companies we started, I would say it, you could almost divide them evenly in half and half of them are this kind of archetype one, uh, you know, kind of first time founder that's had a lot of responsibility, has seen, seen the movie at least once and, and wants to do this at some point in the future. And then archetype two is the kind of serial successful entrepreneur that's, that has rung the bell once or twice um, and, and wants to do it again, but sees the, the venture studio model as a way of going a lot faster 
and, and getting support in the areas that they're competent in, but don't actually really want to spend their time. I mean, we've had founders tell us, my time is more valuable than owning 100% of this company, mm -hmm. right? I would rather seed uh, uh, you know, a, a slug of the cap table to a venture studio in exchange for having control of my time and being able to focus on the things that I'm world, uh, I'm world class at. Yeah. The other thing I want to that, that come back to is design as well, because you mentioned how that's kind of a core tenet of, of best in class or, or world class for you guys. What have you seen in the last like, you know, decade where I think design has gone from a huge competitive advantage, call it in 2010 era, right? to now, do you think design is more table stakes? Like you have to have a, a, a great brand uh, and product that's really easy to use and built out? Or are you, is it still like, hey, design can still be a competitive advantage and it's not necessarily table stakes right now? Oh yeah, no, well, I mean, it is table stakes and can be a huge competitive advantage, meaning, well, I guess, first of all, just by way of definition, I mean, it's sure. easy to just think of design as decoration or aesthetics or, ooh, that looks good. And I love those glossy buttons and the information's architected in a way that's coherent, you know, and that that is all design for sure. But but our definition is a bit more expansive and, and, and we tend to think about the, uh, you know, from a structural perspective, how is design impacting everything from how you hire, how you tell your story, uh, you know, how your brand shows up in the marketplace, how the product works. So it's, it's, it's a pretty broad spectrum. And I would say it's just such an easy thing to at least get to a grade letter B at, right? And, yeah. and, but there is a distinction. Things, things can take, people can take design seriously. And, and to your point, I think it is table stakes that you are, intentional about how you design your organization product and brand but then there's another click up you know the difference between good and great is the last 10 percent, right mm -hmm. so yes you need to be good at all of that but then where are the areas where you can leverage design in your business to actually move from pretty good or really good even to fantastic to excellent and so i think that's an area that you know most people still people still struggle with. And, and I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, people want to sprinkle some of that design pixie dust, you know, at the beginning, and they fail to integrate that kind of design philosophy into every facet of the business. I mean, one way I think about it, I had a call last week with a portfolio company, an external investment we made out of our venture fund. And they're a hundred person plus organization they're growing like crazy, a really terrific business. They have one designer who supports sales, marketing, and product, right? And they're thinking about how do we build out our design work, which is the right question to ask. And, 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 and the counsel I gave them was, should, you should hire a head of design that reports to the CEO. And that person should build a team underneath them that is brand focused, marketing events go to market you know that kind of side of the house and then another team that's product focused but they should report all the way up to one terminal design leader who takes total responsibility for making sure that that design ethos is integrated into the entire organization yeah. usually what you'll see even with very sophisticated organizations is you'll have design leaders but they'll be siloed you'll have design leaders on the marketing side you'll have design leaders on the event or experiential side design leaders on the product side and 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 they don't they don't talk and collaborate and they're not harmonized the way they should be even despite their best efforts so i think the way you do that is hiring a design czar early on and it doesn't need to be the you know former see a, you know, design lead at Nike, right? It can be even a junior mm -hmm. person that is taking full responsibility for making sure that's integrated all the way across and down in the organization. Yeah. Uh, kind of riffing on, on design, and this is where I would love to get your insights because you know, you, this is either what you've done for a living as an investor, uh, as, as you work at Studio Science, and, and this is kind of around the idea of, of fundraising. And I think some of the things that you've instilled in me uh, when we were getting started is that how much fundraising uh, is really about storytelling and, and what your story is at that time. Um, and so, you know, what do you think, what, what, how should a founder think about their story in relation to like their, their pitch, right? Call it for like 
a pre-seed seed round? Is it just like a buzzword or does like being able to be a good storyteller really matter uh, for you having a successful fundraise? No, it matters. It's like the most important thing. Um, again, you can, you can be a bona fide genius, right? That knows more than everybody in the room. And if you're incapable of packaging that up in a way that's comprehensible uh, to your audience, um, it's, it's all for naught. So no, I would say in business period, the most important characteristic you have as a leader is the ability to craft and articulate compelling narratives period. And, and I'm happy to talk about the investor deck. That's one specific instantiation sure. of that. But think about when you're hiring people, like you've got no product or crappy product, almost no revenue. You're competing against Google. You're located in Topeka, Kansas, you know, whatever it is, whatever headwinds you're facing, the, the surest way to overcome that is to be able to tell a evocative, compelling, seductive story to whoever you're trying to pull into your into your orbit. So it's the most underrated skill in business leadership, period. And certainly there are there's increasingly a lot of scholarship and writing in, in, in college courses around helping people become better communicators. And to some extent, they might even use the language to become a better storyteller, but but fundamentally it is about storytelling. And I think, you know, the mistake that most, that, that many uh, uh, early stage founders make is they, they've got a pitch coming up where they're, they're going out to raise financing for the first time and they get on Google and they search top 10 pitch decks or how to build a great pitch deck or whatever. And then there's all these like prescriptive 20 slide, you know, templates, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about the market. Tell us about the team. Tell us about your pricing and packaging. What's use of funds, you know, and, and all of those things need to find purchase in your narrative, but it's never a linear template, right? And, and I always encourage founders to start with story and think about it very fundamentally. Think about what is the, what is the uh, literal structure of a story? You, what's the plot? You have a plot, you have a protagonist, you have an antagonist, you have a, you have a climax, you have a denouement, you know, there, there's like that storytelling structure can and should be applied to, to the pitch and the same way it should be applied when you're talking to the press or when you're in the midst of re recruiting a, a, a VP of sales. And, and I just think it's not people's default setting to think that way, but if you look at like the greatest business leaders uh, you know, or business people in the history of the world, you will find that with very few exceptions, the character trait they share is their ability to tell compelling stories. Who are some of those great people? And you can't say like Steve Jobs or Iger or any of those, like who, who are some other great storytellers that, that you think are just maybe under the radar or, or folks that um, you, you've studied over, over your you know, I, I don't. I don't know if they're under the radar or not. And don't worry, I won't mention Steve Jobs, um, who, who was good at that. No question about it. Um, you know, my. I guess my favorites. It's funny. I'll mention a couple from the world of fashion. Coco uh, Chanel. Um, you know, uh, who was a you know a, a women's fashion designer, and of course, uh, you know, invented Chanel number no. five, and maybe the most popular and important, you know, scent in the history of mankind, you know, she, she was a masterful storyteller. And, you know, she basically shaped what fashion was for six decades. She reinvented the way kind of women think about themselves in terms of fashion. And you think about, and she was not a perfect person. If you, if you Google Coco, you'll find some pretty ugly things about her, her, her past, but what you can't takeaway from her was that she shifted an entire industry and, and kind of remade it in her image. And in a way, what was so masterful about her ability to storytell is she invited women into the story. So, so, and which I think is like a really key part of storytelling. It's one thing to be like the old guy in the chair, just reading from Aesop's fables. It's another thing when you are building a story in real time and figuring out how to invite other people into it so it becomes their story as well and i think she was masterful i think 
I think Ralph Lauren, and and I'll I'll stop with my fashion, you know, okay. icon here in a moment. But I think Ralph Lauren is a great example of a masterful modern storyteller, because I mean, ultimately, when you think about what is what is clothing, right? I mean, it is the ultimate commodity, right? So in order to elevate that into something that helps people shape their identity, both the way other people view them, but the way they view themselves, um, that takes some masterful storytelling. I. Uh, and then, and then there's there's the I mean, uh, Sam Walton was a phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That I'll channel my inner Arkansan, you know, for a moment. Teddy Roosevelt, uh, one of my favorite storytellers. And if you consider politics business, then I think we can include him in in the list. He was a master. You know, he was the product, right? He was a right. master at shaping the public's perception of who he was. I mean, one of the most fascinating like reinvention stories of all time. And like, if, if your listeners aren't on the, like the Teddy Roosevelt, you know, train yet, get on it, go buy one of his, um, one of the many, many, many biographies written about him, but he, he was able to remake himself through storytelling. Um, so th those would be, I'm not going to mention any tech CEOs, although there are, I love it. There, you know, there, there are many, I think in tech, you certainly have, the uh, kind of monolithic, self-made, you know, Western ideal of the Steve Jobs who, you know, um, fights against, you know, the establishment and, and, and reinvents a category. But, but in tech, what I find so fascinating is not individuals who are great storytellers, but businesses that are great storytellers. The company itself, you know, that is, that's inviting people in to help kind of co-create the narrative. And I, and, and I think there's a lot of those. I mean, I think that, you know, Airbnb is a great example, um, you know, which again, kind of reinventing a category and inviting people in to the process of storytelling. So those, those would be a few. So, uh, so storytelling uh, is obviously integral to kind of part of that raise. I'm assuming getting feedback, right, is, is, a big part of that, like how do I iterate and improve the story? How, how do you advise founders that you're working with either, you know, investments from the fund or, or your founders you're starting companies with at, at the on the studio side, how do they go and get, how should they think about getting feedback from uh, their raise or their deck or their story? Is it from peers? Is it from potential investors? Like who should they be leaning on to get feedback about their, their story and how it's being and, and how it's resonating? Yeah, yeah. Well, I let's just talk about and I mean, there's lots of options and opportunity there, but let's talk about investors. I, sure. I think one one mistake founders make oftentimes is they're they're waiting until they've got the story nailed. They're waiting until the deck is highly polished and has been put through the Photoshop Flex Capacitor 2000 and it comes out all shiny and 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 perfect. And, and then they, you know, they head out to, to start pitching. And, and oftentimes it's positioned as I'm, I'm raising money. Here's my story. Here's my deck. What do you think? And I encourage our founders to start laying the tracks much, much, much earlier than that, long before you're raising. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. the advice we give our founders is you're not raising. Okay. You've got nine months, 12 months, cash in the bank, you are not raising. But now is a good time for you to, A, start building relationships with potential investors. And that would be a fun conversation to have as well. Like, how do you build your list? Um, and then B, start testing your story. You're not testing, are they interested in investing in you, right? Now, sometimes that happy accident emerges and someone goes, this is brilliant, you're brilliant, here's a preemptive term sheet, right? But it's disingenuous to go into those conversations saying you're not raising if you're really raising. I'm saying start having those conversations long before you're, you're ready to raise. It's going to go a long way toward relationship building, getting on the radars of those funds that you might be interested in taking money from in the future. But more importantly, you're able to test your story in a, in a very low pressure environment because you're not worried. You're not going home at night and going, oh my gosh, I hope they, I hope they respond in 24 hours. You're not worrying about that at all. You're able to play really loose, really free because you have nothing to lose. You're not mm -hmm. trying to raise money. And so, I, you know, there's, 
some debate as to like who are those or what's the what's the prototypical early conversation like what do you want to go talk to the people you don't want to invest in you first so you don't have to worry if you screw it up or do you want to go talk to sequoia first because they're your dream investor and, and i think that differs that differs in a big yeah. way the, my big piece of advice is start testing your story and seeking feedback long before you need to go raise dough. And, and the best way to get those, those meetings, because again, investors are like their radars up, right? If you, if you're like, we're not raising, but I'd love to come in and pitch the partners that's going to fall as, you know, either on deaf ears or it's going to be perceived as very disingenuous. My, my recommendation is always find some investors that have a particular area of expertise or a particular perspective um, where you're struggling. Right. So it might be I want to get thoughts on variable pricing and how that maps to our business model and how we should best tell that story. Well, go find an investor that has a lot of experience in variable pricing and go talk to them about that issue. And, and while talking about that issue, you're you're solely seeking advice, but you're going to be forced to tell the story of your business. But you can do it in a low pressure way where investors don't feel like a piggy bank. You're you're actually tickling that part of their humanity that we're all like subject to, which is um, we don't we don't want people coming to us who only want something from us unless that's advice and counsel. And you'll be shocked by how willing even the most pedigreed investors are to give you advice if it doesn't come along with an ask. Yeah. Love it. All right. Sp speaking of which, um, we have a couple of minutes left and I want to make sure we rip through these questions. Uh, we can rapid fire on these are questions. We ask all of our guests. We're kind of trying to draw some conclusions here, uh, to help founders. Uh, so founder reaches out to you, Christian cold, cause they want to get your thoughts on building a design driven culture. Uh, what's the best way for someone to, to what's the, how does, what kind of cold email catches your eye? Well, uh, it needs to be exceedingly brief. Right, so you know, if you send me a two thousand word essay um, with forty documents attached to the email, that's that's just that's not going to be a good place to start. So something that is incredibly brief. I'm talking two hundred words or less. Brief, mm -hmm. Right, so that's number one. It's got to be brief enough that I have a shot at catching the big idea within fifteen or twenty seconds. Um, I. I'm pretty confident that uh, everyone is also susceptible to a small amount of flattery. Now, what I mean by that is not, boy, you've got great hair, uh, you know, or man, congratulations on making, you know, investments in 10 unicorns or things like that, because those folks hear it all the time. But something that indicates to the reader that, you know, who they really know who they are, right? Mm -hmm. Either citing historic investments that you either admire or or think are maybe germane to what you're doing referencing an article or a podcast that they were in just something that that quickly cuts through the clutter and creates some kind of personal connection um you know in, in, in most of the cold emails i get are addressed to whom it may concern uh, occasionally it's christian spelled incorrectly you know so just the details uh, especially when you're only writing 150 words, uh, matter and making sure yeah. that you're you're connecting with them in a way that's not creepy, right? And what I mean by that is, if they're stalking you on Instagram and referencing something you did three years ago, that's a, that can be a little off-putting as well. So brief, personalized, um, inciting something that uh, allows the viewer to know that you're diligent and have done your homework about who you're talking to and what you're asking for. What's the number one thing a founder can do to help speed up a fundraising process? Oh, I'll go back to my other comment. It's laying the tracks early. It's yeah. laying the tracks early. It's building relationships long before you're making the ask, right? So you're not, okay, we've got 90 days of cash left in the bank. Let's go over to Crunchbase and pull a list of seed investors that work in this industry and start frantically dialing for dollars. What you really want, by the time you're ready to raise money, you want to know 
who your top 10 list is, you want to have already had one or more interactions with them, preferably at the partner level, but that's okay if you can't make that happen either. But it's, it's like everything else, uh, you know, the value of relationships compound over time. So if, you're, if your first outreach to potential investor is when you're fundraising or even worse, when you're at the end of your runway, you're gonna be, you're gonna be in really big trouble. So uh, counterintuitively, it will go faster if you start earlier. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense. What's the process uh, for you guys when you invest in a company uh, at High Alpha? Is it all partners vote? Is it uh, you have to have a majority? Is it all partners have to say yes? Like what's the process for how you guys make decisions at High Alpha? We, we have an investment committee that the four partners sit on, but we are not the only voices in the investment committee. We have uh, half a dozen other uh, people that represent different functions in the studio, as well as on our capital side. And I would say it's it's pre pretty meritocracy driven, right? I, I would say if all four partners were a no, it's probably not going to happen. But we're, we're very, and I know a lot of people think this is bad, but it's just the way we're organized. We're very consensus driven. So it is unlikely we're going to make an investment unless everybody is somewhere between pretty and extraordinarily excited about the opportunity. With that being said, we have the ability to pound our fist and say, I'm doing this. And people are going to, so far, six years in, no one has ever said no to that, right? But as a general yeah. rule, we really strive for um, uh, a high level of consensus and yeah. with at least one partner, if not two, that are, that are pounding their fist and are gonna take responsibility. But we're not structured like a traditional fund where you've got partners operating in silos with their own senior associates doing work. And uh, we're, we're highly collaborative. And um, we, we think that that um, manifests itself both on the studio side where we're starting net new businesses, but also on the capital side where we're making external investments. Yeah. Okay, last question. Uh, you've been at the forefront of kind of a couple of different movements, you know, the studio science, the, the work for equity, Gravity Ventures being one of the first kind of angel driven seed funds, um, high alpha with the studio, like any, any guesses or thoughts of, or themes you might see for like the next decade of, of ways companies might be started or, or equities raised? Well, I mean, you, you know, to a hammer, the whole world's a nail, right? So I... I think there's a place for all of these asset classes from angel investing all the way to private equity and everything in between. Within the venture kind of slice of that, however, I do think that uh, venture capitalists making their own luck as opposed to uh, waiting till they find a team and a theme or a thesis or an industry they're interested in, but, but alternatively, venture funds saying, this there is a business that should exist that does not exist today we are in a unique position to help uh catalyze that to help launch it you know the venture studio is a very explicit and specific model which is all about starting your own companies but increasingly you're seeing traditional venture funds move from just the the eir model to mm -hmm. actually helping launch these companies i mean it's snowflake probably being you know, the biggest example of a very valuable company that I, I do very quickly that was really launched out of a venture fund. So if the if the venture studio model is a very concretized, very specific version of that, we're beginning to see that bleed out into the left and to the right and everything from individual angel investors to storied venture funds are increasingly realizing that they can't just be in catcher mode, they have to be in pitcher mode as well in terms of, uh, you know, kind of making, making their own luck. The, the other big trend that I'm personally very interested in is, and I don't know if this is germane to your question or not, but I'll throw it out there anyway, yeah. is, uh, or, or something we're very interested in high alpha, is, um, Kind of reinventing professional services and consulting as uh, either a pure tech or a tech enabled business. And it, it used to be a very dirty word in venture and in technology to talk about services. And increasingly, we're seeing more and more businesses becoming software companies over time, but that started as really kind of a pure services business. And I, and I think it's so smart because 
you know, we, we think of software as a service, capital S software as a lowercase s service. And we're beginning to kind of flip that model at high alpha and think lowercase s software, a, a uppercase service. And we're very comfortable with, uh, with a company that wants to be a software company for the first year, generating the bulk of their revenue from services, because it is, it's the ultimate customer validation. It's not, hey, customer, will you buy this product? It's, hey, customer, will you let me solve this problem? And ultimately, the customer doesn't care if there's a robot doing it or a person doing it. And if you're able to get people doing it early on, the learnings that come from that are remarkable. And it actually allows you to run a much more capital efficient business, which allows you to control your own destiny. Yep. Love it. Christian, thanks so much for your time. I'm glad we got to work in Coco Chanel number five to this podcast. I don't think I was expecting that. So thank you for that. Uh, and until next time, but thanks again. And uh, we'll see everyone soon. Mike, great, great to visit with you. And thanks again for having me. Take care.